This is Live Well Talk on Brachytherapy for Prostate Cancer. I'm Dr. Dustin Arnold, Chief Medical Officer at Unity Point Health, St. Luke's Hospital. When it comes to prostate cancer treatment, there are a variety of options. One of those options is brachytherapy treatment. Here to tell us more about this treatment option for men with early stage prostate cancer is Dr. Thomas Richardson, urologist at Physicians Clinic of Iowa Urology. Welcome. Thank you very much, Dustin. Good to see you. Uh, you know, the, the, the old phrase in medicine that you might not die from prostate cancer, but you might die with it. You yeah. Know, we say that. But give me a flavor for younger people having prostate Absolutely. cancer. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, so that is, that is a common and a conversation we do have with men that, uh, you know, if a man lives long enough, statistically, there's been studies done that have shown that uh, if you did a biopsy on all 90-year-old men who pass away, you know, about two thirds of them will have some degree, some form of prostate cancer, many of which are low grade, low stage, and they never knew they had. So, you know, we certainly don't want prostate cancer to be a circumstance where the, uh, the treatment is worse than the disease. And that's a conversation we have with patients about the utility of rectal exam and screening PSA, which is a prostate specific antigen, which is a simple blood test. Um, you know, that's a very controversial topic. And uh, there are strong ar arguments on both sides of that. But we, as urologists, the American Urologic Association and other uh, professional societies, feel strongly that screening for prostate cancer once a year with a rectal exam and PSA is important for men beyond the age of 50. And um, for people with high risk, meaning a, a strong family history, uh, documented by uh, male relatives on their father's side, uh, we recommend screening sooner than that. And the, the, the important thing to realize is that just because you have a blood test and a rectal examination, that doesn't mean we're going to be eager to proceed to more invasive testing such as a biopsy. It just means it's going to uh, initiate a conversation. And that conversation can be to explain exactly what is prostate cancer, what's the incidence of prostate cancer, what are the things that we would look for that would perhaps cause us to be more alarmed and think that someone needs to be aggressively treated. But the answer to your initial question is it is not a disease of old men. We, we on a daily basis, diagnose men in their 50s with prostate cancer and feel strongly that many of those men, had they not been screened and diagnosed, would have had prostate cancers that ultimately would have shortened their lifespan. And th that's why we approach things the way we do. As an internist, it seems like there are, there's a type of prostate cancer that's aggressive. Correct. As opposed to one that's more indolent. Correct. And that's actually... Uh, there's a lot of new feelings about prostate cancer. So it used to be we would look at prostate cancer, a person would have a biopsy and there is a, a grading system done called the Gleason grading system. It's named after a pathologist who initially described the, what, what, what prostate cancer looks like under the microscope. And it's given a numerical grade from one to five. And then they look at the most prevalent pattern and the second most prevalent pattern in any given microscope slide, add those two numbers together, and that gives you your Gleason score. Well, we've taken it a step further now, and there's been a lot of research done that instead of grouping people into Gleason scores, we're, we're grouping them into grade groups. And the grade groups start with grade group one, grade group two, and so on, where the lower volume, meaning less number of biopsies, lower grade, meaning lower Gleason scores, get termed grade group one, and then it progresses from there. And there's also been a lot of studies that show that people with Gleason pattern three prostate cancer. So if someone has Gleason pattern three throughout their biopsy for a total score of six, there's been large studies that show that that may not actually have a significant metastatic potential. And we're going to treat those people differently than we're going to treat someone who comes in with a hard nodule on exam, a pattern four or five on their biopsy. And a way to highlight that is that there's now a new concept for men diagnosed with prostate cancer who have very low risk or low risk prostate cancer and a small number of cores positive and low Gleason score where the treatment of choice is actually active surveillance, meaning we watch the cancer and there's protocols for how that can be done that involve regular exams, regular PSAs, and even uh, now we're, we're integrating MRI into that. And there's, there's, a, there's a, uh, um, an evaluation system for M MRIs where a, a lesion can be graded from one to five, uh, and the, the malignant potential of that lesion increases as the grade of that lesion shows up on an MRI. And these are specific 3T MRIs, and it's important that you have radiologists who are very experienced at reading them. So we're making a ton of progress in prostate cancer to try to establish that not every patient 
needs to have aggressive therapy. But at the same time, in cases where we identify cancers that we think are clinically significant and potentially, uh, you know, a, th- a, th- a threat to someone's life expectancy, we have minimally invasive treatments now available that that are highly effective at curing people their prostate cancer while limiting the the you know, lifestyle altering side effects. So, what would be your so your recommendation if I summarize that if if you have this family history on your maternal side is that what you, or for yeah i mean i think in general we just look at at, at family history, family history of, for instance if a patient comes in and says yeah my two brothers have already been diagnosed with prostate cancer yeah that's a different okay so animal. that's a different animal or if a young man comes in and says uh my dad my uncle and my grandpa all had prostate cancer on my dad's side again that, that that's that's somebody who we're going to recommend um you know screening at, a, at an earlier age there's also some thought that African American men should be screened in an earlier age because some studies in the past were done to suggest that African American men present at a higher grade and stage than their age matched um, Caucasian cohorts. But again, there's some controversy in that. But in general, we would suggest that all man, men starting at the age of 50 have a prostate exam and a PSA on a yearly basis, not unlike women who are recommended to do a breast exam and have a mammogram. We always try to cover what what should a pa- when should a patient ask for to be evaluated or think about being evaluated. And my dad would go to appointment with Doctor Bavani and come home, and I'd say, "Did did you tell him about the fact you have to sleep in the lazy boy, and you can't lay flat at night?" Well, I didn't tell him, and he didn't ask. If it would have been important, he would have asked me about it. Right. Well, he does. You know, you just pull your hair out. Well, he doesn't know to ask. You know, you have to tell. So, what are some symptoms? Because as we get older. We uh, get up more on the opposite of the night. So when, when should I go, okay, this is too much? So, and that's always a, a bit of a, um, an interesting uh, uh, dilemma in, is that a lot of men um, associate changes in their urinary pattern that occur naturally as a man ages as their prostate simply becomes larger, which is something called benign prostatic hyperplasia, symptoms such as increasing nighttime urination more frequent urination during the day, having to push or strain, wait a long time to urinate, having to rush to get to the bathroom on time. Those symptoms and prostate cancer can coexist, but it's not that the prostate cancer has, is the cause for those symptoms. So many men come in with the impression that BPH symptoms must be indicative of a problem. And while you can have those types of symptoms with someone who has advanced prostate cancer, in most cases, prostate cancer is going to be completely asymptomatic and only identified because of an abnormality on exam, an abnormality of their PSA independently, or a combination of those two. So, you know, just give you an example. Let's say you come to see me and you say, hey, you know, I'm urinating more frequently at night. And, and, or you say, hey, I don't have a single problem urinating, but yet when I examine your prostate, I feel something that I don't like the way it feels. And your PSA is higher than it should be for your age. That's going to initiate a conversation. I think in the past, Many primary care physicians, internal medicine and family practice would assume that every patient who comes to a urologist with either of those abnormalities is immediately going to get a biopsy. And that's just simply not the case anymore. We we have a very informed, uh, educated discussion with the patient and share with them the natural history of prostate cancer. And, and, you know, I'll see some men in my office now in their mid-70s or later who I feel an abnormality and I tell them I feel it and I say... I think you probably do have some prostate cancer, but we don't biopsy them. We simply manage them conservatively. So it's really about, you know, identifying symptoms that could be indicative of a problem. But in most cases, there are very few symptoms that are associated with prostate cancer until it's, it's in its advanced stages. I think going back to some of those side effects that men dread uh, when uh, being evaluated for this, sure. erectile dysfunction and incontinence. Uh, I think everybody, nobody wants to smell like urine and have that trouble. And erectile dysfunction has has some psychosocial effects as well. Correct. So when it comes to treatment, uh, there's the surgical option, but I, I know your area of specialty is the option of localized radiation treatment or brachytherapy. Tell me what that is. Yeah. So you know we're we're really proud at at, at Physicians Clinic of Iowa Urology that we really feel like we have people who can offer all forms of therapy for people, and we have people that have expertise in that area. Obviously, you know, surgical removal of the prostate is now uh, transformed into a uh, robotic-assisted laparoscopic procedure 
that in my era 20 years ago, the patient it was in the, you know, it was a four or five hour operation. The patient was in the hospital a week and had a catheter in their bladder for three weeks. Well, we've now uh, progressed to the point where it's a two and a half, three hour operation. It's an overnight stay in the hospital and, and there's been major developments along those lines. So, and to that end, it's important for patients to realize that surgical techniques have now improved to the point that we, we feel pretty strongly that we should be able to have a man regain relatively normal urinary control so that it's not, um, as I call, socially uh, inhibiting incontinence, meaning they can go do the things they want to do. Might they have a little bit of a, a need to wear a light pad or something like that? Yes. But there's people who've had this surgery that uh, but absolutely can have totally normal urinary control. Same can be said for erectile dysfunction. There are surgical techniques where nerve sparing, the, the uh, neurovascular bundles that control a man's ability to achieve an erection can be surgically spared. And, and, and that's only done when it's appropriate. Meaning if they have, our, our number one goal is cancer control with preservation of erections and urinary control kind of goal 2A and 2B. But again, a man can, can have an operation and uh, re- re-achieve the ability to um, have a normal erection over time. It takes time, and there's a, a, there's a, a recovery process that goes along with that. Um, I, uh, I focus much of my energy on some of the minimally invasive procedures and uh, do a lot with what's called prostate brachytherapy, and that's B-R-A-C-H-Y-T-H-E-R-A-P-Y, or low-dose rate brachytherapy. So Radiation can be delivered to the prostate either from an external source, which is 3D conformal or external beam radiation therapy, or it can be delivered by an internal source. And there's two ways to do internal uh, radiation, either HDR, where, where the catheters are put in temporarily and a high dose, a high dose of radiation is delivered to the prostate over a short period of time, or permanent seeds are implanted in the prostate that have um, kind of a, a longer um, dose kinetics on how that works. And unlike surgery, uh, brachytherapy is an outpatient procedure. Uh, it involves really two separate uh, brief procedures. The first is done to determine exactly how many needles and seeds are going to be needed to implant into the prostate gland. That's called the treatment planning or the volume study. And then the definitive implant is done several weeks later where um, uh, it, it, placing needles in the space between the scrotum and the rectum called the perineum, we are able to very uh, meticulously place a single seed or a series of seeds that are stranded together so that we uniformly cover the entire prostate gland with the, with the necessary dose of radiation. And we do this in conjunction with and in a very collaborative effort with our radiation oncologists here. And it's a, it's a team approach. So when you say that you use the term seed, about how big are they? So it's about the size of a mechanical pencil lead, and they're you know a couple millimeters in length, and then those are equally spaced so that when we implant the whole gland, we have a uniform distribution of those seeds. So each seed has a dose curve of radiation around it that will cover a specific area of the prostate, so that ultimately the entire prostate is covered. With the advantage being that the amount of radiation that the surrounding tissue gets and the urethra and the rectum receives is substantially uh, diminished. And in doing so, we limit the radiation toxicity that could affect those those tissues. And for a long time, we were doing uh, this with radioactive iodine or I-125. And the idea behind that is it has a a iodine, I-125 has a half-life of about 60 days. And it takes several half-lives before Patients don't have to be cautious in terms of being around other people. And we've transitioned to radioactive cesium, and cesium has a much, much shorter half-life. And that's created some opportunities for patients and their families in terms of not having to take some uh, precautions in terms of exposure to small children, pregnant women. It's, it's on the order of days rather than weeks or months. Oh, well, that's, um, that's a but, big, yeah, it, big it, increase it's a big It's a big difference. So when you determine the need for brachytherapy, if I understand this correctly, it's... Not uh, all patients can... Yeah. So, so there's a specific type of patient who we're going to... You know, when we meet with a patient, we, we go over all the treatment options. And in some patients, they're simply not a candidate for active surveillance or watchful waiting because they have a very high PSA or a high Gleason score, or um, maybe somebody who's already presents with a, a substantially high PSA 
and an exam and biopsy findings that would suggest that they no longer have cancer that's complete, prostate cancer that's com completely confined to their prostate, where they may not be a candidate for any curative approach, but there are certainly things that we can do to keep the prostate cancer under control for an extended period of time. But generally speaking, brachytherapy is ideally suited for people who have uh, those grade group, low-grade group prostate cancers with um, primarily Gleason plat pattern 3 plus 3 or pattern 3 plus 4. Somebody who's got a higher Gleason score is not going to be a candidate for brachytherapy by itself, but might be a candidate, and there's some recent studies that support this, that that patient might be best suited by a combination of seeds and external beam radiation therapy where the total radiation dose is the same but it's delivered by two different modalities and also um, we place that patient on uh, a, a, a medication that actually drops their testosterone down to a, a very low level it's called androgen deprivation therapy or the the slang term is hormonal therapy and there's studies that would suggest that when you do that the the effects of the radiation are magnified by doing so but um, ideally, a patient who is going to have a prostate volume of less than 60 cc's, so not somebody with a very large prostate, somebody who doesn't have a lot of um, obstructive or irritative urinary symptoms, um, Gleason patterns that are, that are a little on the lower side, and lower volume disease, or patients who just happen to be not um, suitable candidates for more invasive surgery like a laparoscopic robotic approach that carries with it some greater risks of anesthesia and recovery. That was going to be my cetera. next question. Is it, is it at times, is it a therapy for those high-risk patients that a general anesthetic procedure is not Yeah, it, Yes, it certainly is, um, among other things that we sometimes talk about. But it is, it is, it is very minimally invasive in the sense that um, the, the area where the needles are, and, and I'll just give you, you know, in general, a, a standard implant typically involves somewhere between 16 to 22 needles and somewhere between, let's say, 50 and 75 seeds, and it depends on, you know, how the planning lays out, the size of their prostate in general. But, you know, within days, the patient can be back to relatively normal activity. We have some, we, we have some limita limitation in their activity just to be safe, but there's no recovery from incisions and surgery. There's no catheter in the bladder afterwards. And there's really very little risk of urinary incontinence, stress incontinence that would require a pad and alter their lifestyle. And the effects on erectile dysfunction, while uh, not insignificant, are not immediate like you would see with uh, surgical removal of the prostate, where they will, a patient will initially lose the ability to, to achieve a spontaneous erection. If a man has normal erections prior to brachytherapy, we would anticipate them being able to maintain that ability and perhaps over time start to lose a little bit of that ability that oftentimes would respond to oral medications. But the impotence and the incontinence issues are definitely different with brachytherapy compared to surgical therapy. Now, it also is worth mentioning that with surgical removal of the prostate, we have a final patholog pathologic specimen that gets looked at. And if there's something adverse in the final pathology or the patient's PSA doesn't drop to an undetectable level, those folks are um, candidates for some additional or adjuvant radiation therapy. When we do either brachytherapy or external beam radiation therapy, while doing a salvage prostatectomy, if those were to fail, is, a, is an option. We don't go into it with that in mind because the complications and the difficulty that one might encounter to have surgery after radiation is significantly greater. So we go into it thinking it's going to be the only therapy that they need, and we simply monitor their PSA over time, anticipating that to drop to a level substantially below one and stay there. This might be a tough question, but let, let's pose it to you. Um, you have twins, and one shows up, they have identical cancers uh, of the prostate, and one gets surgery and one gets brachytherapy. H how are they doing at five years? Uh, if, you, if you believe the studies, in appropriately selected patients who have you know, low-grade, low-stage prostate cancer, those two folks are going are gonna to have very simil similar outcomes as it relates to uh, disease-specific uh, recurrence-free survival. Okay. All right. That, okay. No, I... But but they might not do the same in terms of their uh, the symptoms they experience afterwards. And that's not to say that one is better than another and will result in less symptoms. It just is to say that the, the, the symptoms that are associated with either of those and the potential, I hate to use the word complications, but the, the, the side effects of that 
of that chosen procedure are potentially going to be different. If that, if that yeah, answers no, that the question. No, that completely answers the question. And it's kind of along the lines of what I tell patients all the time is there will never be a study done where we can randomly assign people. You know, we can't find 100 guys and assign them to four different treatments and prospectively follow them over the next 20 years. So what we have to do is find 100 guys who are similar in their initial diagnosis and work backwards from there and find 25 of them who chose seeds, 25 who chose external radiation, 25 who chose surgery, and do a comparison that way. And that's kind of a flawed way to compare it, but it's the best that we have. Yeah, it, it's kind of like you, you don't want to be the control group right. on, on the no efficacy one, of a, a parachute out of an airplane. No right? one is ever no. going to agree to be randomly assigned to one right. of four options. They right. want to have control over that. Yeah, absolutely. Dr. Richardson, thank you so much for joining uh, us today. This has been great information. Again, that was Dr. Thomas Richardson, urologist at Physicians Clinic of Iowa Urology. Thank you for listening to Live Well Talk On. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe. And if you want to spread the word, please give us a five-star review and tell your family, friends, neighbors, strangers about our podcast. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, or wherever you get your podcast. Until next time, be well.